This conference will now be Andrew. recorded. I will. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day, this time together. Lord, we lift up our country and all the prayer requests that we have spoken and unspoken. Uh, you know what they are and who they are for. We trust you, Father, because sometimes we don't know what to pray for others. Uh, and we're not sure what to say. So uh, we pray Paul's prayer in Colossians because it, it's appropriate for every person in every situation, aligning perfectly with your will. We ask these requests with confidence, both for ourselves and for others, because we know it's in harmony with your word. First, Lord, help us to be filled with the knowledge of your will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We need to know your plan for our lives, to have discernment to distinguish your guiding voice from our own self-directed notions. Lord, help us to walk in a manner worthy of you, pleasing you in all ways. Help us, uh, our lives should be patterned after you, the one we follow, with the goal of glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to bear fruit in every good work. Instead of being wrapped up in our own work, our possessions, our pleasures, our plans, we should be contributing to other people's lives. Lord, help us to increase our knowledge of you by reading your word and applying it to our lives so that we may gain a deeper understanding of you. Lord, we also ask that through the Holy Spirit, we be strengthened by your power so that we remain steadfast in our faith because we know the Christian life can only be lived through the Holy Spirit's power. Father, help us always to be joyous and give thanks to you for all you've done for us, because we should be characterized by joy and gratitude. You have given us so much. You've saved us, and we are so grateful and thankful for that. Lord, we, we know that too often we focus our requests on our temporal needs and miss the deeper spiritual work that you have for our lives. Uh, we, we believe that uh, our prayers will be much more effective as we look to your word and shift the emphasis of our petitions to your desires, not ours. And we trust you to transform us through the Holy Spirit and the people for whom we intercede. And we are so thankful for that. Lord, open our hearts and our minds to your word tonight and may everything be done in your honor and glory. And Lord, we trust you. You are the perfect one with perfect power to save with an outstretched arm. And, and we ask for salvation for those who would receive you in Jesus' precious name and in the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. And let's make sure that we continue to pray. Uh, for those people that attended Arnie's uh, backyard Bible study, yes. uh, that uh, that they'll find uh, favor with God and that um, uh, and that salvation will be achieved uh, through them opening their heart to the Word of God. Good job, Arn. Yes. Um, if you're following along, uh, we're in Acts chapter 19. And we'll begin this study in verse 13. You remember that in our last uh, study, Paul was in the city of Ephesus on the western edge of the, what we know today as modern day Turkey. And great things were happening there. The culture was being changed and Paul accomplished uh, uh, starting uh, what we would call a Bible school or Bible college, a missionary training school, and people who were graduating from that training were spreading the gospel throughout all of Asia, uh, so much so that we're told that the entire continent of Asia was actually reached for the Lord Jesus Christ. And although there was great resistance going on, at the same time, there was a terrific move towards uh, uh, God. And um, 
there were there was a, an unusual kind of a move of God. And you remember that one of the words that Luke used uh, in our last study, there were unusual miracles which were taking place, but there were people who were being delivered uh, from demon possession. And the Bible informs us that there are forces uh, that can do great harm to the soul. And the Bible tells us that these forces of darkness are in three different categories, the three different types of demonic spirits. Uh, the first one would be that they are temporarily free. Uh, and Jesus talking about a man having a demon cast out of him tells us in Matthew chapter 12 and uh, in Luke chapter 11, starting in verse, 20, uh, in verse 24. When an unclean spirit comes out of a man, it roams through waterless places looking for rest and not finding rest. It then says, I'll go back to my house where I came from. And so when we are, when they are uh, exorcised uh, from a human being, they don't go into the lake of fire. They don't go into some kind of prison, but rather they're able to walk around free. And Satan is one such force. Uh, you remember in the book of Job, uh, chapter one, the Lord said to Satan in verse seven, the Lord asked Satan, where have you come from? From roaming through the earth, Satan answered him, and walking around on it. Yeah, so there are forces that are that are, are free. Now, the second type of, uh, are those who are temporarily incarcerated. We read about these in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 9, beginning in verse 13, which says, the sixth angel blew his trumpet from four horns of the gold altar that is before God. I heard a voice say to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who were prepared for the hour, day, month, and year were released to kill a third of the human race. The number of mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. And so there are demonic spirits that are held for a time in the future where God is going to allow them to be released and then they will do God's bidding. And then the third category are those who are permanently incarcerated. And we hear about those in, in the book of Jude, beginning in verse 5. Now, I want to remind you, though you all know these things, the Lord first saved the people out of Egypt and later destroyed those who did not believe. And he has kept with eternal chains in darkness for the judgment of the great day, the angels who did not keep their own position but deserted their proper dwelling. In the same way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them committed sexual immorality and practiced perversions, just as angels did, and served as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. All right, so imagine how sick and how twisted and how evil and how dark these guys must be. And God granted Satan a, a, a little bit of freedom, but imagine how bad these guys must be that the Lord keeps them locked up eternally. Um, so we have to understand that if we're going to take the word of God seriously, we, we must recognize that there are forces that a human life can open itself up to and very bad things can take place. All right, so that gives us a little bit of, of, uh, of a background that where this study is going tonight. 
And so uh, let's start out with Debbie Leonhardt, if you would unmute yourself and let's and read verses 13 and 14, nice and loud. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus Christ over those who were de de demon possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva. Sceva. Jewish... <laughs> Thank you. A Jewish chief priest were doing this. So you remember that Jesus tells us uh, that some of the Jews could successfully exor exorcise demons from the afflicted. When he was being accused of casting out Satan with the power of Satan, he tells us in Matthew's gospel, chapter 12, beginning in verse 22. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and unable to speak was brought to him. He healed him so that the man could both speak and see. And all the crowds were astounded and said, Perhaps this is the son of David. When the Pharisees heard this, they said, the, the man drives out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Okay. Knowing their thoughts, <laughs> he told them every kingdom divided against itself is headed for destruction, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, who is it your sons drive them out by? For this reason, they will be your judges. If I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. How can someone enter a strong man's house and steal his possessions? unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can rob his house. Anyone who is not with me is against me, and anyone who does not gather with me scatters. Because of this, I tell you, people will be forgiven every sin and blasphemy, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the one to come. So Jesus admits that there were Jews in his day who were legitimately casting out demons. And we have to remember that in Ephesus, during this time, the Jews in the synagogue hated the Apostle Paul. And uh, they're already saying very evil things about Paul and his theology. Um, and um, what's happening is Paul essentially opens up a school for theology right next door to the synagogue. And there is tremendous thing. There are tremendous things that are happening. People are being healed. Uh, People are being set free from demonic forces, and it appears that this synagogue right next door contracts seven hired guns. They, taught, they call them seven sons of Sceva uh, to cast out this demon because the synagogue was essentially losing credibility because of what was going on next door under Paul's ministry. Uh, Paul was able to accomplish a lot of things, and the synagogue was not. And so the synagogue wanted their credibility to be restored. So they hire these seven sons of Sceva. And, and so they find a demonic spirit and they say, we assure you by the, G by the Jesus that someone else preaches, not the Jesus I know and the Jesus I love, but the Jesus that somebody else preaches. And we know that's not going to turn out well, you know, for the seven brothers. Um, we have uh, the first century historian Josephus who tells us God also enabled uh, Solomon 
to learn the skills which expel uh, demons. Uh, then he composed uh, some, uh, such incant in in incantations, uh, in other words, magic spells and so forth, that he left behind him the manner of, u uh, of using exorcism. And, and this method is secure in, in great force uh, uh, unto, under, under this day. Um, for I have seen certain man, again, this is Josephus talking in my own country, whose name was Eliezer, releasing people from their, uh, who were possessed in the presence of the space of, in his captains and the whole multitude of soldiers. So that was Josephus' uh, accounting for, for uh, some of those things about exorcism. So apparently these guys ha have some sort of an incantation uh, that they were able to take all the way back to Solomon, and that is what they were using. All right, um, let's see. Uh, Diane, would you like to read? All right. She um, some technical problems. She's having some technical difficulties. Uh, Joyce DeWalt, would you read verses 15 and 16, nice and loud? One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. All right, well, now some of your Bibles will say, I know uh, Jesus and I know Paul. And in English, it, it's the same word. Uh, some of your Bibles might say, I know Jesus and I recognize Paul. But if you go back to the original Greek, uh, the demon is using two different words, um, uh, even though it's the same word in English. Uh, so where it says, I know Jesus, that word is gnosko. We've studied that word many times in past Bible studies. That is an intimate knowledge, and uh, which is the only way you can get that is through having a relationship. And so the word is gnosko. It's uh, Strong's Greek 1097. And that means he's, an, he's intimately aware uh, with Jesus or who Jesus is. I've seen him. I've studied him. I know everything about Jesus. And then he says, I know Paul. Now that's a different word. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, Strong's uh, number 1987, epistem, epistem, epistemi. epistemi, thank you. And the idea there is that I'm keeping my eye on him. I'm aware of him. And so these seven brothers haven't a clue who they're dealing with. The demon goes crazy. And this speaks of an incredible strength uh, of demonic powers. Uh, notice the demon, uh, uh, he's ripping the, he's ripping or tearing the clothes off of these seven guys. These seven guys are jumping out the windows. They're running out the back doors. They likely have claw marks all over them and bite marks. Note that Luke, and remember, Luke is a doctor. Notice that he says they ran, to, ran out wounded. It's an interesting word that he uses there. Um, in the Greek, it's Strong's 5135. Uh, no, traumatizo. Traumatizo. It's where we get the word trauma. It's a medical term. Uh, so if you find yourself this evening in a trauma center, you know you're not going to be in a very good place tonight. And so these guys are experiencing trauma. Likely they're having deep wounds. Likely they're going to need some stitches and some medical attention and that kind of stuff. All right. Um, Let's see, uh, Carrie Crawford, would you read verses 17 through 20, nice and loud? All right. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus, 
and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mighty grew the word of God and prevailed. So we have to be very careful to see what it is that's going on here. Notice we're being told uh, those who believe, these are people who earlier received Christ, but what did they do? They held on to, uh, let's just call it a bridge to their past. It's like saying, yeah, I'm accepting Jesus and I'll see how things go, but I'm keeping my options open. I'm holding on to the past. If this Jesus stuff doesn't work out for me, I'll be able to go back to the occult uh, that, that, that I was actually saved from or delivered from. But they were allowing the very same stuff to exist in their lives. And one of these things that, uh, uh, that we have to ask ourselves is this, do I allow the stuff from my past life to remain in effect in my life today? Or have I burned those bridges of my past? Have I burned the bridges of the occult life that I used to hang out in and, um, uh, you know, or am I allowing those to be entry points to go back to? In other words, when you dabble in something, you, uh, there's there's a there's a, an entry point in your life. How does one become demon possessed? One becomes demon possessed in the very same way that one becomes a Christian. There are two kingdoms that are warring for your soul. Uh, there's the kingdom of light and life, and there's the kingdom of death and darkness. And both of these kingdoms operate under essentially the same rule. Uh, and what are the rules of, of those two kingdoms? Well, you have to have an invitation and you have to have an acceptance. There's an invitation and there's an acceptance. So uh, in the kingdom of God, we were offered an invitation. And uh, what does that invitation look like? Well, you can find one of those invitations in Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 28, which says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you, give you rest. All of you, take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And of course, those verses would be red line verses in your Bible. That was Jesus speaking. He offers us an invitation. But what must I do? I must give an invitation back to him and how is that uh, that that is how we establish relationships with each other you know how do you establish a friendship you know you 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 you, you, you see somebody you want to have a friendship with so you uh you know so you you make a little innuendo i want to be your friend you know and then the other person, if they like what they see, they say, okay, I want to be your friend. And so there's an invitation and acceptance. And then the other person makes an invitation. And that's the beginning of a relationship. How is it that you came to know Jesus Christ? Well, you know, you were living a life outside of that relationship with Jesus. And how were you brought together? There was some curiosity which developed. You know, perhaps some guy or gal in your life 
uh, was sitting, you know, in the break room at your job and reading the Bible and you asked questions and there were some answers being given and curiosity starts up or perhaps you went to, a, you know, some kind of a, a weekend seminar at your local uh, church. Um, and then, the, you know, and then you realize that the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, 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 what it's all about, and, and there's an invitation, and, uh, and then you accept that invitation, and you ask uh, Jesus for forgiveness of your sin, uh, and uh, you accept Jesus as your friend and as your Lord and Savior. Now, God does not... Please be careful here. God does not barge into a person's life and demand that they become a Christian. Like it or not, God doesn't do that because God is not going to violate our free will. We were all born in the image of God, which means we have free will and God's not gonna violate that. And you have to understand that Satan works in the very same way. There's an invitation, and, and, and then a person accepts that invitation and then invites Satan into their life. It's the very same way that you can go, one way or the other. There's two different roads that one can travel, light and life, or darkness and death. So here you have these believers. They've been messing around with, some, with this stuff, and they say, we have a clear... We have seen a clear demonstration of the power. We're not going to mess around with this church stuff any longer. We're going to be full on for Jesus Christ. And all of these vices that I have that I have uh, in my life, which is an offense to God, I'm going to get rid of. And notice they don't sell it at a church rummage sale or something like that, but rather what they do is they destroy it. All right, we're going to take a brief moment to talk about uh, the first verses up through verse 20. Who has a comment, a question, a takeaway from uh, the verses that we've studied so far up through verse 20? All right, Sylvia's first. Okay. Um, we got to ask ourselves, do I allow evil practices from my past my uh, to remain in my life. Um, maybe, maybe you used to be into uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, what's that called? Uh, Sagittarius, all that stuff. Oh, astrology. Astrology, or you know, something. It sounds simple and easy, but it, it's a door. Okay, it's a door, and um, uh, we got to be careful not to leave that door open to Satan. Uh, because he is the ruler of the, the kingdom of death and dark. Okay, one has to invite either kingdom into our hearts and accept that way of life. And you need to close the door on the other way of life. Okay, we need to choose wisely because it's an eternal choice, not just a, uh, this life kind of choice. It goes on for eternity. Uh, and it is our choice. God is a gentleman. He does not violate our free will. He does not force us into a uh, relationship with him, even though he knows that would be the best for us because of Romans 8, 28. All things come together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And we need to seek that road of light and life uh, and, and seek the old ways. It's called the old ways in our Bible study on on. Uh, 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 the feast of the Lord, and we need to avoid the path of death and darkness that Satan is offering. And he often he paints it up very in a very attractive way, but it's still death and darkness. And and we we need to leave that old life where it where it died. Okay, at the point where we receive the Lord and are saved. Thank you. Good job. Yeah, we know that uh, that Satan is just liar. Well, yeah, he attempted. He attempted Jesus, but of course, Jesus would not uh, would not be tempted. 
and uh, quoted scripture to him, uh, which is the way you beat uh, Satan. Go ahead, Dan, you're next. Unmute and speak nice and loud to your, toward your, uh, your microphone, Dan. Nope, nope. Uh, oh, sorry, it was, it was Arnie right next to you. Arnie. Go ahead, Arnie, unmute yourself. Yeah, verse 16 just reminds me of the incident when Jesus approached the demons and men, and they said, if you're going to remove us, put us in those pigs, and then the pigs went down into the river and drowned. It's just like that, that's what this verse 16 reminded me of. That's why, that's why it's known as the path of death and destruction. Jesus came, he might have life and have it more abundantly, but Satan came to... Um, to kill, steal, and destroy. Yep. Okay. Any other comments or questions or takeaways up to the verse uh, uh, up from 13 to uh, 20? Uh, go ahead, Carrie Crawford. Okay. Um, this may be a question, uh, a combination of a question or a comment. Okay. When we go back to verse. 13 and it talks about exorcists and we talked about the these seven men of Sceva they thought they had a recipe for that from Solomon and I thought I recently heard that the difference between Jesus and this activity was Jesus did not um, he re, he called out demons but he did not practice exorcism he called them out of his authority and when he called them out, they were out and gone, and not not that they came back and jumped back in, but he delivered people permanently. And um, yeah, I, yeah, I agree with you on that point. I was just bringing that up uh, as an example that Jesus actually uh, 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 stated that the Jews were ex exercising demons out of people, um, but the Jews, the Jewish leaders were accusing Jesus of the exorcisms under the authority of the devil. That's all, that was just my, my example. Go ahead and finish your thought though. Oh, yes, well, that was basically it. And I just wanted anybody to have any other idea on that. And also I wonder if, well, we hear about exorcisms and all this nowadays, and would that perhaps be one of those open doors that can people can get pulled into, that they end up into some occult or into something they shouldn't have gotten into? Yeah. You know, and I, I thought you also brought up an interesting point, and it's a good point, that I think demons can only be taken out of a person under the authority of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and Jesus using the Holy Spirit with people like Paul and Peter and even you and me in certain circumstances uh, has given us the gift of healing people under, the, under Jesus's authority. Uh, but, but just keep in mind, as you're saying, Carrie, that, that all authority is under Jesus and it's not under Satan. But any other comments about what uh, Carrie was asking? Well, actually, I think uh, God has relegated authority to Satan on this earth until he returns because uh, Satan is the God of this world. So actually the Lord has relegated some authority to Satan. That's why it's so dangerous to play with the occult because he's got a lot of power. He's got, you know, he, it's not as much as God, but Satan definitely can rule and reign over people if they allow it. You know, we have to allow, you know, I mean, we, we're the ones with the, you know, Jesus came and knocks at our the, the door of our heart and asks to come in. And, and, uh, and if we allow him in, then we will be saved and he will come in. But um, the same goes is true if we allow evil forces enter into our lives. And there are a lot of people out there, you know, into the occult and thinking that they're just fine. And 
you know, there are a lot of people who get into these astral projections and, you know, all sorts of horrible things that they're playing with fire. I'm just saying they're playing with fire because the spiritual possession is a very scary thing. And just remember that whether you're talking about exorcism, sorry, you're talking about demon, demon possession, you're talking about the devil, or you're talking about uh, uh, having dinner with friends, it's all the same. When an invitation, an invitation always comes with the option to the party being invited, that party can say yes, or that party can say no. Okay, because if it's if there's not the option to say yes or no, then it's not an invitation, but rather it's an order. All right, and so what the Bible is teaching us here is that you can have a relationship with God or you can have a relationship with the devil, and the the relationship begins in the very same manner and the very same rules. There's an invitation and you can accept it or reject it. Fran, did you have a comment? Yes, I was going to say I think it's exciting that in verse 19 it said that many of those who practice magic brought their books together and began burning them when they actually heard the truth and they believed apparently that they took those books and started burning them, which ended up according to the scripture to be valued at quite a bit of money. So I think that's kind of exciting that the, the truth, they understood Jesus, understood what Paul was, what was trying to teach them and they wanted to change. Yeah, and the value of those books, I don't remember the reference now, but it was something yes. like it was something it's like awesome. equivalent something equivalent to a full year's salary of an entire army. It was a big number, fifty thousand, whatever the units were. It's a lot of money. Uh, who else has a comment or a question or takeaway before we continue with verse twenty one? Sylvia? Okay, so you notice here in these scriptures, the unforgivable sin is resisting the Holy Spirit. Because if you don't cooperate with God's Holy Spirit, you're not going to receive eternal life. So that's an unforgivable sin. So that's really the only unforgivable sin. So many people resist receiving the Lord because they feel as though, oh, they've had such a horrible past or whatever they, you know, whatever they've done is just too much to be forgiven of. No, 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 no. I mean, look at Paul. He went around and, and murdered Christians just for believing in Jesus. Okay. And he was forgiven. As a matter of fact, he was used in a mighty way by God to reach the world. He still is to for this the day. kingdom of God. And he still is to this day because it's all recorded in God's word. So, um, so don't resist the Holy Spirit uh, when God taps you on the shoulder and says, I want you, I choose, you know, I choose you for my kingdom. You should say, thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. And get down on your knees and say, I repent of all those things I used to be involved with in the past. I shut the door on that. I burn the books, the, the old occult books and all that junk. I don't want it around to tempt me anymore. I want to get rid of all of those old evil things that I used to be involved with. And I want to move on with the Lord and help clean up your life. So many people go, oh, I can't go and receive the Lord now. I got to clean up my life first. No, no, just as I am, they need to come to the altar and kneel and before the living God and say, Lord, forgive me. Take me in to your kingdom. And he will. And he is that loving and forgiving that he will do that. So anybody who is listening right now who hasn't received the Lord, we all have. But I'm just saying that if you think that you got to clean up your life before you receive the Lord, it's not true. That's a lie from the pit. You, you go to the Lord and say, Lord, I am willing. Come into my heart. Forgive me. And I will be set free because Jesus came 
to set the captives free, to break the chains that bind people. And whatever chain is in your life, he can break it. So you just look to him because he is trustworthy. He is faithful. And he is loving and kind, full of mercy and grace. And we thank him for it. Amen. Good job. Good job. Okay. Yep. Um, uh, okay. Roger Hershey, would you read verses 21 and 22, nice and loud? Afterward, Paul felt impelled by the Holy Spirit to go over to Macedonia and Achaia before returning to Jerusalem. And after that, he said, I must go on to Rome. He sent his two assistants, Timothy and Erastus, on ahead to Macedonia while he stayed a while longer in the province of Asia. So Paul was in Western Turkey and he has this vision to go to all these different places. He believes that it is part of God's will for his life uh, to end up in the, in the city of Rome. Now, what, he, what is he doing and why he sends he, these two guys ahead of him? Uh, what we know is that when we compare scripture with scripture, we understand that this early church, uh, there was a sharp division within the church. You had two sides or two factions of the church. You had the Jewish side and you had the Gentile side. And the Jewish side of the church uh, thought that they were more righteous. They thought that they were more holy. They thought that God liked them better than the Gentile part of the church. And they uh, essentially snubbed uh, the Gentile side of the church. But what happened in Jerusalem, very interesting how God evens things out, especially when there's pride involved. They, the church, the Jewish faction of the church in Jerusalem, they went broke. They decided that they were going to uh, live in a commune uh, structure. The, there were more people taking than there were people who were giving, and they ended up bankrupt. And so Paul sees a terrific opportunity here, not for revenge, not to get back at the Jewish side that were snubbing their noses at the Gentile side, but rather he sees an opportunity to to unite both factions of the church. So he sends Timothy and Erastus ahead and they take up offerings. And they take these offerings and they deliver those offerings to the bankrupt Jewish side of the church in Jerusalem. Now, if I think that I'm better than you and then somehow I end up in trouble and you come and you help me, doesn't that challenge my pride? You know, how can I continue to say that I'm better than you when you're the one who's helping me? I didn't help you, but you helped me. So how can I continue to say that I'm better than you? And this is what Paul wanted to see, uh, that somehow the Jewish Christians would soften up a little bit. Um, uh, stop being so self-righteous uh, uh, and see that these Gentiles that were believers were their actual brothers and sisters in Christ. That was what was going on there. All right, uh, Linda, would you read verses 23 through 27, nice and loud? 27, let me go. 23 to 27. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. He called them together along with the workmen in related trades and said, Men, you know we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. 
there is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself, who is worshipped through the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. So uh, this is this is really interesting if you think about it. The influence of Christianity is beginning to cut into the customer base of those people, those craftsmen who are making a living off of idolatry. More and more people in this community are leaving their pagan worship and they're following Jesus Christ, thanks to Paul and his ministry. And they're taking over the country for the benefit of Jesus Christ, which is marvelous. But to the rest of the unbelieving community who profits from pagan worship, they're pointing their collective fingers at the Christians and saying, these guys are causing my customer base to fall or to flee. And so you can see where uh, that there is a genuine revival going on here. So these non-believing tradesmen are making profits, all kinds of profits, making souvenirs for the Temple of Diana. Now this temple um, was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. They had 127 pillars that were 55 feet high. It had inner rows of pillars made completely out of jasper. Uh, there was uh, inside, it was over two football fields large in their terrace there. And uh, and it was, a, it was a tourist attraction, a tourist uh, destination. And when you're a tourist, when you're a tourist, what do you do? You buy t-shirts, you buy a little Mickey Mouse statue, you know, and then when you get back home, everybody knows you went on vacation and where you went. And so these guys are making uh, Diana trinkets and souvenirs, and they're noticing that sales are falling and inventory is piling up. And so these tradesmen are getting desperate regarding the future of their livelihood. That's what's going on. Now let's take a look uh, at what uh, what we have left here. Um, uh, let's see, Dan, uh, would you read 28, 29, and 30, please? And then Sheila, 31, 32, 33. When they heard this and were filled with rage, they began shouting, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's Macedonian traveling companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the assembly, the disciples would not let him. Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not know why they had come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude. The Jews Putting him forward, and Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. Thank you. Um, Helen, verses 34, 35, 36, and then Arnie, 37, 38, 39. But when 34. they realized. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. But when they realized. Helen. he. Yeah. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison, uni unison for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. A city clerk quieted the crowd and said, fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus 
is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven. Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious or blasphemous of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. All right, and then uh, Howard or Fran, uh, verses 40 and 41, please. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with nothing because of what happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion. Since there is no reason for it, after he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. All right, so they they end up dragging these two believers into this theater. Now, this theater is massive. It seats 25,000 people. And you have a handful of guys uh, who are turning this city upside down because the church decides that it's, go it's going to be uh, it's going to live a true form of biblical Christianity. When the church decides that it's going to get its act together, that is when the impact is felt in the unbelieving world. You know, our human nature is very good at getting all worked up. We see our culture going downhill. We have a lot of complaints about Sharia law taking over the state of Minnesota. And we look at Fox News and we act as if somehow those guys are the are at fault or, or those guys are the problem. And somehow, uh, if the unbelieving world would just get its act together, uh, that we would have paradise on earth. You know, what the Bible tells us is. What holds up revival is the church. It, it, it's when the church decides that it is done living a defeated life. When a believer decides, I'm tired of putting on the act, I'm tired of pretending that I'm more spiritual than I really am, and we're prone to find you know, accountability partners. Now, there's nothing wrong with accountability partners, but it's very easy with our human nature to tell people, oh, we're praying 15 hours a day for you, and perhaps we're, you know, we're we're fudging a little bit, uh, or I, I read the Bible from cover to cover. I've read it 50 times. You know, it's possible with our human nature to stretch the truth a little bit. And you and I have to understand that we are not accountable to one another, but rather we are accountable to God. I'm not accountable to you. You're not accountable to me. God sees every secret in our life. And the day is going to come where each one of us is going to have to give an account for our lives before the one who sees all secrets in our lives, and that is the Lord. When you and I take uh, that thought seriously, that's when real reform will take place in the heart of a man or a woman, and we begin to demonstrate what true Christianity is all about. Understand that true Christianity is a threat to groups of people. It's a threat to a group of people who seek control over other people. And that is why you see certain groups of people or certain religious groups of people who when uh, uh, some of their group accepts Jesus Christ, they wanna kill these people. 
because biblical Christianity says God is the one who is in control, not some other man or person in charge of that religion. You don't need a priest. You don't need a pastor. You don't need a rabbi. You don't need some kind of a feel-good uh, preacher. Uh, uh, we don't need intercessors in our life because we have a relationship directly with God. And how can that group continue to control you if, if, uh, if you give your life to Jesus Christ? How can I control you if I really believe that, that, that you can go to God directly to him, to him, uh, to him himself? Why in the world would you come to me when you can go directly to God? So Christianity is a threat to other people who want to control people. In addition, Christianity is a threat to those who want to make money off of our carnal nature. We saw a little example of that tonight in, in um uh, in our study with these uh, tradesmen. Christianity is a threat to strip clubs. Christianity is a threat to the sex trade. Christianity is a threat to drug cartels. Christianity is a threat to any religion who is profiting from you following them. If they cannot make hard cash off of you, you become Christianity becomes a threat to them. When you and I begin to give an effective witness, that's when we are going to begin to see our culture change. So it's not you and me praying this week for a change of heart in our country or a change of heart in our culture, but rather it's you and me praying that my heart that my heart has changed, that I become different, that I burn those bridges that led, that would lead to my past life. You want to see change in our modern world? We need a revival of the entire church committed, uh, they're committing their lives uh, to true biblical Christianity, and that's when we're going to see change in our world. All right, who's got a comment? Who's got a question? Who's got a takeaway from any of the verses that we studied tonight? Arnie, go ahead. I got about six or seven comments, but I'll just give you a couple, and then I'll let somebody else talk, and then I'll give you the rest. The first one, I would say, is the most important verse in this lesson was verse 23, where it says, uh, they are concerned about the way. And in the verse, the word way is capitalized. That's right. If you, look, if you look at John 14, verse 6, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. Good job. The next thing I'm going to tell you or say to you is that it's interesting that Paul was leaving Corinth. And he was going to go to Jerusalem. He got his hair cut. He's getting ready to go to Jerusalem. And then he, instead he goes to Macedonia, which is exactly the opposite way. He's going east and Jerusalem is west. He thought that that money that he was going to give to the people in Jerusalem was that important. Okay. Uh, the, I have so many comments. I'm sorry. This Alexander that is referred to here. We don't know who he is or what he is. Uh, I know that I heard of him in First Timothy. Okay, he caused Paul trouble there, also, and he said, "Among among whom are Hymene and I go to his name and Alexander, who I have handed over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme." Okay. Another comment is in in first, I think Paul knew about this uprising or this battle imagine 25,000 people in that assembly confused okay but he knew about it because in first corinthians 15 he said what do i gain if humanly speaking i fought with beasts at ephesus 
If the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. He knew that this battle was going to happen ahead of time, or he knew that this was caused anyway. I will, let, I will let somebody else speak before I go further. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Good, good comments. Sylvia's next. Okay, so pride cometh before the fall. So in the early church, the Jews snubbed Christians, and then they set up a commune, but then they went broke. So then the Christians bailed them out financially, which challenged the Jews' pride. I think the Lord had that all in his, his wonderful plan. So God used uh, the Christians' generosity to break the ice between the Jews and the Christians. And the Jews' uh, charter from God was originally to witness to the entire world. That's why we talk about the prayer shawls, that tzitzis on the prayer shawls were representing representative of the four corners of the earth that the Jews were supposed to take God's kingdom to. Yeah, the four fringes. So, so, the, so the Jews' original charter was to witness to the entire world. They didn't do it, and they kept in their holy huddle, which a lot of folks do, even Christians do that. And uh, so, so the Lord used all this uh, situation to humble them a little bit and make them realize that the Christians were willing to help them out. And see, when when we are generous with those that are rather undeserving, uh, then that's a witness to an unsaved world or even to a saved world. So, and also the the when the church stands on the word of God, that is when it makes an impact on the unbelieving world. And that's when the church grows the most, by the way. The church needs revival to make an impact for God's kingdom. Because we need to be different from the world, or what's the point? You know, what's the point? Who are we helping if we're not different from the world? So that's called uh, being sanctified or right. set apart. Set apart. Uh, we have to be a little closer to holiness, uh, which is living according to the principles of the written word of God. Go right. ahead, and we need to demonstrate evidence of restoration in our lives. What is it that speaks the most, Arn, to your family about your life now? It's that re that restored life. It's that change, that turn about and turn toward God that you have done at this stage of life, which is so unusual in this world. That's what really speaks to people, evidence of a restored life, because Jesus is in the restoration business. And it shows the redeemed life, which gets the attention of the unsaved. Good job. And then they want to be like that, too. There's something different about that person. I want to be like that. I need that in my life, they say. And that is the beginning of salvation for them. Yeah. Good job. Who else has a comment, a question, or a takeaway from the scriptures, uh, verses uh, 13 to 41 tonight? Yeah, Roger Hershey, go ahead. On the amount of uh, the value of the books that were burned, uh, I don't think it's the value of the books that's important. It's the burning of the bridges behind you. And that applies to people today that when you become saved, you need to burn some of the bridges behind you that uh, would draw you back into the old life and, and uh, seek support of those that would support you in your uh, life with Christ. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right in that assessment. Uh, yet there, there's, there's got to be a reason why Luke wrote that large number there, and it's likely because he wants to take the point that you just made and magnify it to accentuate how important this principle is that you're sharing with us. So good job, Roger. Yeah, it's a significant sacrifice. I think that's, and, and Roger, I like your point best. 
but also it's a significant sacrifice that they have made to demonstrate they have a change of heart. Yeah, Carrie Crawford, you're next, unmute. Okay, um, Arnie spoke of Alexander and um, we just know that he was a Jew. And so I just, I, I think this was a very significant situation. So picture ending up in a theater say a movie theater and got all these people there and there is confusion. And so they, they, they dragged Alexander forward. He didn't seemingly volunteer to come forward and he happened to be a Jew. So even knowing that he was a Jew, they just, all the people started proclaiming the name of Diana, great is Diana. So you think, well, why would they do that? Why would they feel so threatened with one man, one man who is called a Jew? So somewhere within themselves, they must have known that the person called a Jew, what they believe, first of all, was different than theirs, but their, but that the God they worship was mighty and they felt threatened and they felt they had to protect this name because Diana was worshiped throughout, it says, all the all the world at that time worship Diana. So they felt really threatened. So I think that's very significant that one person could bring that much angst about, okay, why are you here? I don't feel good, but I'm, I'm going to raise my hand for this that I really, I, I, I know I'm, I'm supposed to hold on to this, but wow, who are you? Why, why are you different? Thank you. Good job, yeah, Terry. Go ahead, Arne. Yeah, uh, you know what T Terry is talking about. Uh, Alexander was a Jew, and Jews didn't accept or have uh, what do you call them statues or idols that they worship. Jews didn't do that. And Alexander didn't like the Christians, but he also didn't like the these other people that were praying to and worshiping Artemis. Uh, it's interesting or almost fascinating. You know, <laughs> once again, once again, Paul didn't criticize Artemis. He didn't criticize these things like he did in Athens. He criticized all the false idols, but he didn't hear. And Artemis, by the way, was a huntress and protector of young women. Um, if a woman wanted to become pregnant back then, they would pray to Artemis for that pregnancy. But uh, Demetrius, this is really cool. Demetrius acknowledged with the rest of his union, I'll call it, that Paul is being so successful that it might end up a Christian world. And, and I thought that was really, really cool because there's nothing better than to have the enemy recognize you're winning. Okay. Okay, the last comment I'll make tonight. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what I think anyway. Um, <laughs> we got 20 minutes, Arn. <laughs> do you know that today we need another Paul? Because there is not one Christian church today in Ephesus. Not one. It, it Cruise ships won't even go there, even though it's right on the water. Cruise ships won't go there. Now, Ephesus wasn't taken over by... Demetrius's union and, and people that were uh, worshiping Artemis. Ephesus is taken over by Islam. And there, like I said, it, we need another Paul there because there isn't one Christian church in Ephesus. Good night. Thank you, uh, Arn. Appreciate your comments. Who else has a comment? Question, take away from tonight's lesson. Dan, you're up next, unmute. Yeah, earlier uh, Arnie mentioned that uh, Jesus had cast the demon into the uh, herd of swine. And I just thought it was uh, interesting uh, in, in this uh, lesson we see uh, uh, Luke uh, talks about an evil spirit, four, four different verses he talks about a, an evil spirit. Uh, the other way the uh, the Bible, which is the, the word Paneris, is the evil, 
Uh, the other way that they that the Bible in the New Testament talks about spirits is unclean spirits, which is at the cartos. So you have either evil spirits or at the cartos or unclean spirits. So I find it interesting that Jesus took the, took the uh, demons and put them into something unclean. Yeah, it's a good point, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Good job, Dan. Any other and comments? And then they hurtled to their death because guess what? The ultimate thing that the adversary wants to accomplish is to kill you. But the ultimate, ultimate thing that he's, penultimate thing that he's trying to do is to kill you eternally. Yeah. Okay. And even though he, he paints a pretty picture of what the sin looks like, it, it ends in death. Go ahead, Dan. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah. No, the, other thing, the other connection is that in, in verse, uh, so in verse is, uh, I wrote it down here. Verses 12, 13, talk, talk closer, talk we can't closer hear you. to your, yeah. in verses uh, 12, 13, 15, and 16, it mentions evil spirits. In verse 21, it says that Paul was resolved in the spirit or, or put in the spirit. Another translation would be put in the spirit. Um, and that, that phrase, put in the spirit, uh, first appears in Matthew 12, 18. Behold my servant whom I have chosen my beloved in whom my soul delights, I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. And then if you kind of drill down through, uh, put your put the spirit, you know, you go through circumcision of the heart, you go to Ezekiel, how he's going to fill us with clean water. Uh, Jeremiah, he's going to put the law into our hearts, all, all of that. So all kind of ties together. So I thought it was kind of interesting. He uses evil spirit four times. But then Paul is resolved, resolved in the spirit as he's leaving. Good one, good one. I wanted to, oh, go ahead, Fran. I just want to say that I think when we look at how stepping out and doing things that we don't feel comfortable doing, you have to take a risk. And I think that's what I'm going to be praying for myself to not be um shy about speaking out when i probably don't want to make waves in the water you know what i mean and i think i thought about you rob because you and sylvia stepped out and started teaching the word of god not that we're waiting for jesus to come he's already come and I think what a risk you took. Well, it wasn't that must popular, have been difficult at times because some of your friends. Yeah, I think some of your friends kind of thought you had gone off of your ochre, you know. <laughs> they plucked him like a weed. All of his Jewish friends from childhood plucked him like a weed. But, you know, I bet a lot of them are watching these videos now. Well, that was the whole reason why I started the uh, video uh, Bible studies on YouTube was they don't have the courage to talk to me, but likely they're they're watching. But even though uh, they were alleged friends, uh, my real friends are right here tonight and on Thursday nights. We have uh, we have True Blue leaving friends. Who encourage uh, us, like yeah. Fran. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, sentimentally, it can be a you. little sad. Uh, what, what, you know, when you make a sacrifice like that, but God always yeah, replaces okay. that with, uh, okay. you know, I don't want to say tenfold, it's millionfold. It's I mean, hundredfold. the relationships that we have are much more meaningful now That's than right. they were before. And, and all of those former friends, who plucked me like a weed because of my faith. I mean, they certainly could come around eventually and have meaningful friendships and relationships with us again. But, uh, you know, there's your invitation. They have to accept it. And it's like the people in the uh, amphitheater who, was, who were so threatened by the truth because then, then they risk being wrong. I mean, <laughs> you know, the bottom line is, is when the truth uh, gets out there, people who are believing in, in, in things like 
Diana, the goddess of the hunt, and who is the Greek, uh, uh, she's the Roman goddess. And the Greek goddess of Artemis is also the goddess of the hunt and the moon, you know, all this pookie pookieism, you know, things that are made, you know, gods that are made, little gods that are made by hand, the hands of, of the men who were working the silver. I mean, it's clear that the God of the universe in the Old Testament despises the fact that people work you know carve wooden gods or silver gods or nowadays it might be sports or whatever people give their true measure of devotion to you know whatever it is that you're god money sports power and and the true god of the universe is the only one that deserves to be worshipped and instead people worship these things that they've made with their hands or you know themselves and 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 the true God is offended by that. He should be. He's Good. the only one worth it. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Fran and then Arnie after Fran. I just wanted to say I think you could be considered our Paul of modern times. Oh, <laughs> sweet. <laughs> uh, well, you could be knocked off your pony. <laughs> well, I appreciate your heart behind that, but. Uh, uh we're we're nowhere close to that but thank you dear you've always been a great encouragement go ahead on yeah <laughs> yeah you can get closer go to macedonia um you you're the one that told <laughs> you're the one that told me i should not just read the verses but i should understand the words in the verses in verse 31 it refers to asiarchs now we remember that paul was there for three years and asiarchs are governors and prominent people not necessarily believers in what paul was saying but they're prominent people and they became his friend uh, i thought that's interesting uh, that's yeah. i said i wasn't going to say well, yeah, because uh, they're influential in the in the culture there and if they become believers they certainly could help influence others i agree that's right Sylvia? Okay, so I thought early on uh, they were talking about unusual miracles and deliverance from demon possession, and that there were three types of demons. I thought that was interesting. As a matter of fact, I thought it was fascinating, Arn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, one was when, when, uh, uh, when exercised, these demons were free to roam. And then a second type were when uh, the, some demons who are held for a time, but God will release them later on to decimate most of the evil in the world. And then there's a third type of demon. demon. Uh, there are some that the Lord keeps locked, locked up, up for eternally. Eternal. Yeah, for eternity. Yeah, because they are so bad that, you know, probably the world wouldn't survive them. Yeah, so you think about that. I mean, you think about the fact that that Satan has been given his way with the culture, mm -hmm. uh, and yet there are demons that are even more disgusting uh, that have been locked up for eternity. You gotta wonder how 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 horrible they are. And and Fran, who has the keys? <laughs> of <Jesus. laughs> That's right. Yeah, so uh, That's right. I just I just heard from our, our little Jesus girl, Beverly, who uh, was having a hard time for some reason getting in, but uh, hopefully she'll join us next week. Uh, speaking of which, uh, next Monday. Nice segue. <laughs> you like that one yeah, I was next scared. monday scared. we'll uh we'll be uh covering <laughs> acts chapter 20 the entire chapter verses 1 to 38 and then if you're available this thursday uh at 6 45 to 8 30 we'll be covering first corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 19 and we hope and pray that if you're available that you would choose to join us and uh uh, while you're thinking about any other comments, I would just want to remind you how much we appreciate and love each and every we one of you. you. We're just so grateful that you uh, support uh, this Bible study. And if you know anybody that would benefit from this, you could either share the video or invite them to come on live with us. 
and uh, please remember, uh, we didn't mention this earlier, but please continue to pray for the Leonhardt family yes. as Debbie continues to take care of Gary as yes. he's going through a major illness. And pray, and, uh, pray, for, pray for caregivers pray. because we know Debbie's his and, caregiver. And pray and pray that uh, so. Gary continues to grow in his spiritual life, mm -hmm. even though he's being challenged with his physical life. Uh, so continue to pray for the Leonhardt family. Uh, any other comments or questions? Yes, go ahead, Arn. I know I said I wasn't going to say anymore, but I just seemed that I can't stop. I know you probably discussed you, you handled this last week in the class, but I missed it. But I did find fascinating verse 12, where it said that aprons and handkerchiefs that touched his skin were able to get rid of evil spirits and cure diseases. I found that fascinating. Yeah, well, you know, it's uh, that 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 verse is all about faith. And we talked about it extensively, but it's all about faith. Uh, it wasn't about Paul's perspiration, but rather it was about people who had believed, who believed in Jesus and the message that Paul was delivering of Jesus. And whether it was lying on the street or the sidewalk waiting for Peter to pass by where his shadow would would fall over them. Uh, they believed, they had faith that they would be healed because they were so attached to Jesus. And uh, and we gave an example, Arn, uh, about the woman who was uh, bleeding for 12 years and that she felt like if she could just touch the fringe of the garment of Jesus to be healed, and sure enough, her faith healed her. Thanks for reminding and us of bringing that up. Uh, um, that was his prayer shawl. That was his uh, Carrie, you had uh, fringes, or in Hebrew, tzitzis. 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 Uh, the four corners of the world, remember? That's the prayer shawl corners. Yeah, Carrie, go ahead, nice and loud. Um, I have a question comment. So um the verse Speak up, honey. the earth is okay. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So when we say that Satan now has authority in this world, in this realm, um did that come from uh he, he took the authority from Adam? And that's how he got it. It was not okay. really given to him, but he took it from Adam. Well, it was actually given to him by Adam and Eve when they sinned against God. They see God had given authority over the world to Adam and Eve. But when they sinned against God, they forfeited the authority over the world and now satan rules this world although it is temporary it is for a time it's not forever and when the lord returns he will strike evil dead okay there will be death so uh, thank god he's coming back <laughs> and there's a crown for those who have joy in his returning uh, we got about five minutes. Who else has a comment or a question? All right. All right. Well, then, in that case, um, uh, thank you all for uh, your faithful attendance. Uh, please remember to continue to pray for one another. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's someone who has been attending and you don't see their face, you might want to pick up the phone and call them and ask them yeah, to come back. We, we miss them, them. Uh, or how we can pray for them. Yeah. Please remember to continue to pray for Daniel uh, and Denise Rudder yes. as Daniel recovers. And, and for um, for that wrist to heal, so he has one functional. Yeah, hand. and for uh, for Boyd Nixon, who is uh, having, hip surgery. having hip surgery and recovering this week. this this week, uh, pray for them and continue to pray for one another. Who would like to close us in a prayer? Who would like to volunteer? Just hold your hold your finger up like this, the correct one. He wants to he wants to pray.
Okay, I'm the only one with the finger up, so I guess I'm going to pray. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day, Lord. Just so grateful to come together uh, with like-minded people who want to know you, Gnosko, know you and intimately in a very special way and grow their relationship with you, Lord. We, uh, we just thank you for all of the wonderful lessons in the scripture we studied tonight. We thank you for continuing to grow us and heal us. Thank you for, your, uh, for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you for causing your countenance to continue to shine upon us. We thank you for your graciousness and your mercy and your gift of shalom, of peace, of wholeness, of fulfillment to all the days of our lives. And we thank you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. Amen. And in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen.